Um, first thing on our agenda after that is to welcome our new uh, member, Kathy Nigella. Welcome, Kathy. Your hand. <laughs> She's a retired science teacher, semi-retired. Yeah. I guess most of you know her already. Um, yeah, I recognize some faces. <laughs> um, long time Hadley resident. Anyway, welcome mm -hmm. to our committee. Thank you. So next public comment, 15 minutes. Three minutes each. Anybody? Sure. Okay, so we need to cultivate the uh, the habit of introducing yourself when you're going to stand okay. up. My name is Tony Fiden at the, uh, Five Cold Spring Lane in Hadley. Uh, I just get uh, two two quick points to make. One is uh, is accountability. And this is something that Sue is going to talk about, and this has to do with the complaint that was issued regarding Ms. Nevin Smith and her comments um, regarding the, the climate change, uh, people who attended the climate change meeting. And this is, uh, I did make a complaint to the select board, and I know Sue has made a complaint. And I know that Ms. Nevin Smith has apologized to another select board member for her comments. However, she didn't mention at all her comments about what she said about the, basically us. I assumed that I was one of the people you were referring to. And um, my problem with the comments, you're entitled to your opinion, but those were not based in fact. They are demonstrably untrue. No one has ever said that climate change is not happening. Not, not at any meeting I've been at. I certainly haven't said that. That's an untrue statement, and you said it on YouTube for everybody. You, you also said that we are, are here only to disrupt. That's an untrue statement. We've never disrupted. That, that is not our, you said it was our only intent to disrupt. That's, that's a serious accusation. So it bothers me that not only that you made the comments, but these are still unaddressed. And last, last month, Actually, when the comments were, when this complaint was made, you left the room on a pretense and wouldn't even stand up for it. We want accountability from our leaders. That's all we ask. You're certainly entitled to your opinions. And if that's the way you feel, look us in the face and say it. I'm, I, I certainly, that I, I might argue back, but that's, that's the way I feel. Um, and I'll, I'll leave it at that because I know other people may have things to say about that. Secondly, I know that the uh, the issue of the stretch code, the enhanced uh, specialized specialized stretch code, thank you, has been brought up, and I hope that um, I may have missed this, but this, there's been some discussion of how this is going to be, present, be presented, whether the climate change committee will take a stance on this and present that, or whether they will, uh, you know, take it to the town. I'm not sure how it's going to be handled. What the, you know, w once you review this and make a decision on it, I hope that it will go to town meeting. Oh, I hope that it will. Uh, I, can't say I hope that it will be something that people can weigh in on. I've been doing some research on it, and I know that there are some people who are going to speak on it. The my my main concern is basically money. When you're talking about uh, this, is I'm looking at the MIT study, which is kind of the gold standard for this that was came out in June. You're shaking your head, but that's that's what people are looking at. I know. Uh, so the um, they're looking at a single a single family model home of a, a, of an additional cost of twenty three thousand dollars. Tony, wind your three minutes is up. So is that three minutes? Okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Who else? Susan. Hello. My name is Susan Melchin, and to follow up on Tony's uh, comments, at the December meeting, I read statements made by Jane Nevin Smith that she said during a Board of Health meeting that preceded the climate meeting on November 9th. And on YouTube, for the world to see, she says, a group of no-sayers come to the climate meetings and just try to disrupt so nothing gets done. Someone on the Board of Health commented, we've met many of them. Of them. The select board are town leaders that the public looks up to. And if this is not a violation, it should be. Uh, you should not be able to use your public position to make disparaging comments 
about those who do not automatically and unconditionally agree with your thoughts. The public should be able to ask questions without being portrayed as disruptors or no-sayers. I'm not sure if you meant naysayers, but on YouTube it said no-sayers. Um, we as the public, we should be able to ask questions without being looked at in a negative way or for you to make comments about a group who try to disrupt. Um, if that, again, if that's not a violation, it should be because it appears as though you're using your public power and position to lessen the thoughts of others. And for us to feel intimidated by asking questions about decisions you will make that will affect everyone in this room. And so in closing, I want to know if these disparaging statements, and not just I, I'm sure everyone in this room, wants to know if these statements will be acknowledged and will they be addressed? Thank you. Anybody else? I'd just like to say one thing. Sure. Steve, Steve Sinkowitz. Okay. Uh, Robert's rule, that should just be a gold standard, you know what I mean? Just, you don't swear at meetings. That's it. You know, it's just, you got to respect other people's opinion. And that's what the Robert rule was put there for, was so that we have, a, you know, a good meeting where everybody discusses what they think is right or wrong, and that should be enforced, not superseded by a rule that says you can swear. Anybody else? <clears throat> okay. So, uh, can I have a motion to <coughs> approve last month's meeting minutes? Rather. So moved. Anybody second? Second. Um, all in favor? Aye. 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 <coughs> all right. So, Madam yeah. Chair, <coughs> if you could, um, if the board members could keep your hands up. Sorry. Okay. No, you're good. Yeah, no, keep your hands up for like a for like thirty more sec, thirty seconds at least. I can get a hand, everyone. Yeah. Your own okay, so we're voting sides. to approve the mi minutes yeah. again. Okay. Put your hand up. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> All right. So we, tonight we have Chris Mason, who is the uh, Western Massachusetts Green Community Coordinator, and. Art Packetour from, where are you from again? Energy Code Energy Specialist. Right, code Energy, specialist. Energy <laughs> code specialist from PSD Consulting are going to do a really good presentation on the opt-in specialized stretch code, building code, and hopefully, by the, and then we'll have questions and answers afterwards. So hopefully after this we'll have a really good idea of what's involved and whether we want to go before the select board and you know subsequently town meeting or just not do anything with it right now or whatever but at least first we need to understand it so okay. turn first it over to you start guys. Off. Hello everyone <coughs> um, <coughs> glad to be here thank you for having us um, see the switch code yep. so I'm going to start by let's see what do I aim at I aim at this <laughs> It should no. It should be awesome. Okay. Great. Great. So I'm going to start off just by um, uh, today's we're, we're going to new climate policies and building codes <coughs> and review of the stretch code and HERS ratings. I'm just going to kind of put the the, the uh, specialized stretch code in context. To start off with. Um, there's a difference between the specialized stretch code and the stretch code. The stretch code is something that Hadley has already adopted, um, is already in place. The specialized stretch code is, quite frankly, actually a rather small addition to it that you can also adopt by town meeting. Um, so back in 1998, the uh, Global Warming Solutions Act was passed. That's what started the Green Communities Program. It's what enacted uh, the power of putting together the stretch code, you know, energy efficiency built into our building codes. Um, and, and in 2021, uh, the Climate Act was passed, which um, 
moved the authority of the stretch code to DOER, uh, and it required the development of a new municipal opt-in specialized energy code, the specialized code. So the um, Climate Act of uh, 2021 um, uh, said that the state had to come up with this as a way to bring us closer to a net zero house, basically um, trying to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Um, I understand that in Massachusetts about 1% of our building stock is, is built, is, is, we get 1% more building stock every year, so we have new construction. So by 2050, when the state wants to be by net, you know, net zero, that means our new buildings will be around 27% of our building stock. It's easiest to work in um, energy efficiency, renewable energy, a good heating system in a new construction. It's far easier to do it new than it is to, to retrofit a building. Um, and so, um, uh, new construction market helps, and also the new construction market helps drive cost reductions in building retrofits. So, you know, as a new construction um, is putting in heat pumps, then heat pumps are going to become more popular. They become more understanding. There's more, there's more technicians who understand how to use them. There are more contractors who are willing to sell them. Um, more people using them, more people are comfortable with them. And so it kind of blends it into the used uh, housing stock as well. Um, 2030, Massachusetts legal limit is at least 50% reduction in greenhouse gases from um, 1991. This is, you know, by, in Massachusetts, this is our law, is we are going to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, and the state's quite serious about it. Um, let's see. So right now, if you um, were heating your home with one of these fuels up here, this is showing how many pounds of emissions will be delivered per one unit of heat that goes in. So if each, you know, if a house running on oil uses one MMBTU of heat, it's going to create 170 pounds of CO2. Um, you can see here the electric cold climate air source heat pump um, is already using about 45% less um, greenhouse gas emissions than uh, your high efficiency gas. If you have a ground source heat pump, it's even lower. Um, that's at today's, or actually not today's, but not at the 2020's electric grid. Our electric grid's getting cleaner and cleaner. So by 2050, I just changed the slide here, um, by, 2020, by 2050, the electric grid is going to be far cleaner. It's going to be producing a lot less greenhouse gas emissions. And so at that point, cold climate heat pump is going to be around 85% less greenhouse gas emissions um, <coughs> from uh, a gas furnace. <coughs> and so that's without doing anything. Once you put it in, then you know, the state is working to reduce the greenhouse gas emissions from our electric grid. And so every house that's running off of electricity, a uh, high, you know, high-end high -end heat pump, they're going to be getting greener and greener and greener. Right now, this, this is kind of showing the, the uh, predicted chart for uh, greenhouse gas emissions from our electric grid, um, aiming downward. Massachusetts electric grid emissions are declining significantly. By 2050, grid emissions will be less than one-third of what they are today. Therefore, a major emissions reduction strategy is to swap from fossil fuel to efficient electric grid wherever possible. And at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Art. Okay. Thank you. Get into the guts of the hole. <coughs> <coughs> well, that sounds a little nice. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. All right. Uh, you want me to? Oh, I, I think that's, that's all right. Do it. I'll slot here. You, okay. you can have the front. All right. Okay. Um, I also thank you for having us, having me here tonight. Uh, it's a great opportunity to spread the information about the code. There's there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of confusion, right? There's just since last year when the new stretch code went in and then this thing came in too. this we got oh no so I've been with uh, PSD is the company that I work for we we do the training for mass save throughout the uh, throughout the state and I've been doing it for just about a year now just after the code came in and I tell you every time I I uh, I'm from New York right so I, but I work throughout mass and I work with the mass codes and I say and then I go back and, and I'm an engineer at in New York and I do design work and every time I do something I say oh yeah I my we we've got 
horrible codes compared to what you guys have. And it all depends on what you, your, your perspective, but uh, I, I applaud your state for taking the lead and taking the, the brunt of it because that's what happens with leaders, mm -hmm. right? So uh, good job on that, kudos. And in the long run, you guys will be much better off. I just wish that my state would get off. We won't have a new code for, till 2025, and it's already three years old mm -hmm. and outdated. The good part for us is that everybody's already figured everything out, so it's easier for us. So we do get it cheaper because we're not, because we're followers. But, so anyway, we basically work with three <coughs> codes here in Massachusetts, right? We have the base code, and they're o what we call overlay codes, right? We have the base code, which currently, until BBRS gets done, we are currently on the 2018 International <coughs> Energy Conservation Code with our Massachusetts amendments, right? All new constructions in towns and cities that are not a green community, which are few and far between here as, as well. So, um, which is only about 51, is that update, up to date? I think it's close. Uh, very few left. There's very few left. There's 51 communities, which is about 9% of the Massachusetts population that, um, that works with the base code. So it, it's hard when you're, you know, somebody called, one of the other things we do is we, we man a hotline and people call you with questions. And so, so it's very rare that you get a question that's not on the stretch code, right? So um, it's great. We are expecting, this is, this is actually incorrect now. We are expecting the new base code, which is based on the 2021 IECC with amendments to come in sometime either late 2024 or early 2025. So that's the way it looks. Now they have adopted, they've got to put it out for public comment, and then they will have a six month grace period where you can use either code type of thing. So that's the base code. Now on top of the base code, so if you just take that base and you put the stretch code on top, and it's like, um, you know, it's like a transparency type of thing, and we only block out the parts that the stretch code apply to. So everything works in there except that the stretch code uh, will supersede in certain areas, right? It covers new construction, major renovations and additions in towns that are uh, a green community, right? That which are, we so, are. Which yeah. you, you guys. So our, just so you know, a little history here last summer, we were accepted into the green community group. So we're one of the 280 communities. I think that's actually 291. 291. Yeah, yeah. All right. And then it was like the year before at town meeting we adopted we adopted the stretch, the stretch code. Well, congratulations. Hmm. So um, so the stretch code and, and honestly, if I was to be have angst about any of this code, what riles me not, that doesn't rile me up, it's the wrong word. But what gets me more where I find more confusion and harder to deal with is this code. Hmm. Right. This is really, as Chris said, it's a small part. I know it's significant because you know it's like that thing. Well, there's I, when I when I used to teach in college, the kids would complain about the test. Oh, you made it a hundred questions. I said, no problem. Next one, I'll just make it one question with a hundred parts. <laughs> right. And so they had one question. Well, that's all this is. It's it's you know it's only one question, but it's got forty or fifty parts to it. So. The stretch code, the new stretch code that we're working with now took a big, where it took the biggest jump was not only the HERS scores that, that we have to get down to, but existing buildings are in it now, right? There's a big part of existing buildings. There's places where, you know, the code doesn't go out and say you got to upgrade your, your existing home when you're doing an addition, but sometimes it's the only way to meet the code because you have to do a HERS rating sometimes on um, the existing building and the new building. So that to me is where the biggest things are compared to that because that's, that's new. And 
as Chris said, we get you're grown by one one percent of new construction every year, but we're and we're taking care of that. And moving forward, we're taking care of things. But the most permits, and maybe you can back me up. You're the inspector, right? Yes. Yep. Maybe you can back me up. You probably get more applications for existing buildings than you do for new buildings. Correct. Right? That's the biggest housing stock because every year that 1% last year, it was new. This year, it's an existing building. And I am also a practicing HERS Raider, and I get a lot of calls here in, in Mass for people I'm putting on an addition, and I need a, I need a HERS Raider and so on and so forth. Um, so this this is a big impact as well, right? That's a, that's a real big impact. But then we take that and we put on top of it the, the longest name of a code that I've ever heard and so many different ways of saying it, but we just call it the specialized code or the opt-in code. But it's the municipal specialized you know, it's the municipal opt-in opt -in specialized, specialized <laughs> stretch energy code, something like that. But it's the opt-in. And that's called opt-in because even if you're already one of these, you don't have to do that. You can opt into it, right? And it's different than this. So we do, we, and we do these talks all over, and there's a lot of confusion that about between the stretch code and what the municipal code is. Right, but the specialized code is the new one, and we call it the, the net zero because right. that's the goal. That's that's the goal, and as Chris said, it's the law. It's the law of the land. It's the goal, and so they've taken steps. Is it perfect? Absolutely not. I've never met a code that's perfect, and the other reason is they change them every three years. And if we made it perfect now, I'd be out of work in three years. So the people who write codes always leave something to improve. And we evolve with technology. Right now, heat pumps are the hottest thing ever, right? 20 years ago, I'd laugh at you if you wanted me to put a heat pump in anywhere in the Northeast. That's not the same heat pump that's out there today, right? They, never, they weren't good. But if you were going below 30 degrees, it, was, it just didn't work as well. They just didn't work. It kicked in the electric heat. and the whole bit and that uh, so anyway I don't want to I can and, and shut me up because I'll go on and on, and on. <laughs> right, <laughs> all right so uh, so anyway the specialized code is our new one they've got a couple of different paths we'll talk about them here um, there are more than 20 communities now it's over to, it's up over 30 we just put a bunch in this as of July 1st I think there was another 14 that that started it, that, that it's enacted. So that brings us up to like 17 altogether, that's including the city of Boston, right? Um, so the next round is people who have adopted it will start in July of this year. You know, the process is six, it's, it's a six month thing. Once you're, if your municipality agrees to uh, vote on it and adopt it, depending on what it is they may not make it so if you if you adopt it tomorrow you probably uh, I would probably guess just the way government moves that it wouldn't be till next January that that's how they all work there's a six month. it's, it's your, right. it's your well, choice in this case the yeah. specialized code it's, it's really recommended that you give it six, six months, months to a year yep. yeah, yeah. But, it's actually but there's only two times a year that it's going into effect okay June, January and July mm -hmm. So it also gives plenty of time for people to adapt to it. So, I mean, those are our three codes. They're really, our codes are kind of, you know, here's a history. I, I kind of like this slide too, because way back in 2009, these are HERS ratings. Does everybody understand what a HERS rating is? You should explain. Is? Yeah. Okay, so what a HERS rating is, is it's a uh, it's called home energy rating score and it's based on a scale of of zero being a zero energy home and a hundred and more it, the more energy typical homes are around a, not typical but your standard construction type of stuff would be on a hundred so we usually work between like a scale a base, a base code home uh, no kinda. no because our base codes are better than that oh. here. so um, 
But so zeros is what we're shooting for, is, is the goal of the So is it the, the amount office. of energy the home uses? We take, what we do is we, we take a big pot, we model it, we, we model the house, we, we pour in the walls and the roof and we pour in the heating system, we pour in the lights, all the appliances and all that stuff and we mix it up and we come out with this score. What it is is it's it's based on a refer it's a it's based on a reference house. It compares the particular house to a reference house based on a previous code. Is it? Um, and I can't get into to it too deep because it's just confusing. But that's what it is. So the lower the score, the better. So back in two thousand and nine, right? Your base code was at seventy five. Was a her score seventy five? That's not such a, a great house, but it's not bad. It was really good for 2009. It was the, the top, right? Stretch code was 65, so you had a pretty decent little, little bit of a gap. In 2014, whoa, wasn't much difference. There was no difference. Same thing in 17 and in 2020. We keep lowering it, but it, the base code and the stretch code are basically the same. 2023 came around and with the opt-in code, we jumped down to 52. As a HERS rater, I'm going to tell you, and, and I do recognize costs to it, uh, and I'm also actually my first job out of college was as an estimator. So mm -hmm. I, I know how to work the numbers too. But um, going from 55 to 52 was a little bit of a challenge. Not a lot, because you guys were already setting the bar so low here. You guys are, were pretty good. Getting to this 42 was tough. It's not easy. Um, and th for a year, they let us get a stretch code at 42. But this summer, as of July 1st, our stretch code is going to be 42, the same as the opt in code. The opt in code is going to be 42. It, I'm not going to lie, it's going to take very good air sealing. It's going to take very good um, heating system. Heat pumps are almost you know, a uh, foregone conclusion, high efficiency water systems, but a very tight building and uh, triple, probably triple pane windows or some very good windows to, to get there. Now, one of the nice things they've done here with the stretch code currently and the opt-in code is they're saying, look, we recognize it's hard, but if you do some extra things, we'll let you go up. We'll, we'll, we'll release you. So I can do, I can actually, if I installed solar, if I was doing new construction, forget the green one for now, if I was doing new construction and I made it all electric and I installed the uh, installed solar renewable, right? Uh, I could actually go with a 58 hertz rating. They're saying that's okay because even though it's a less efficient house, in a, in a sense, we are still using less and we're, we're, we're contributing to a better climate because we've done that stuff. Same thing here except that the opt-in code will only give you, um, it depends, if you're all electric, uh, they'll give you five points for, for doing solar. If you're multi-fuel or mixed fuel, you've got to do the solar anyway. So, But you can you can do a little bit more and get this up to 45, and that's comfortable. So I think they'll want me to wait for questions at, to the end. Please, please. A move up. Yeah. Okay. All right. Sorry. So same thing's going to happen this year. The only difference is this 42, or this stretch code was down to 42, and that's tough. But we still can get the bonuses to pick up another six points. Wait, I just need to stop you for a minute. <clears throat> yeah. So when you say it's tough, you just need to do more insulation and stuff. It's right? not always that. It's not always just insulation. Because it's um, you're already doing good insulation. There's a point where you can put so much insulation is the there's a diminishing point of return. Right? Okay. So it, it becomes a, a tighter house, uh, more uh, less air leakage, right? And we, we control what we want it. We control where and how the air and how much comes in. That is the healthiest uh, 
scenario type of thing. So that better windows because they're really just leaks in the in the in the walls and stuff. They're mm -hmm. just less. So that's really we're still figuring it out. Okay. To be quite honest with you. All right. So so that's hers ratings. This is a current map of everybody who is the the specialized codes. Um, we we want to fill this in too. But, uh, you can see it's starting to spread out. It's starting to pick up. This map gets updated every couple of weeks, I think. And you can also see that most of the state is the stretch code, right? Mm -hmm. So what is the opt-in stretch, the opt-in specialized energy code, right? We'll talk about low-rise and multifamily. The differences from the straight, from the stretch code Let's get, we'll talk about what they are. So under the stretch code, an all-electric new home, doesn't matter what the size is, you could be, uh, you can actually get those three points. Like I said, you can go to a HERS 45, or you can be a passive house. Passive house is growing in leaps and bounds across the country. It's becoming the benchmark for um, energy efficient homes, the more of the zero, zero ready type of homes and, and so on. They are uh, quite interesting. So as of now, January 2024, our, our HERS for specialized code would be 45 with the bonus, right? For an all electric home. Mixed fuel homes. So I just want to you know, point out, so that's the stretch code. This the stretch the, code the, is the green, forty. The green parts of this chart are. Yeah, I know, but it, it covers both. Right, but but I'm just pointing out that if you're building an all electric house, if you're in the specialized code, it's no different than the stretch code. Right. There's there's no right. there's no added. No, if you're it, it, yeah, go ahead. if you are in the stretch code, you're going to get that extra three points for being electric, all electric. Right. Unless right. you're in an op. The specialized code makes no difference to you. No. It wouldn't make any difference. It wouldn't make any difference. Right. If you're stretch code and you're going to build all electric, it's it's, it's no different than if you're an opt-in. Right. Okay. So mixed fuel homes, we've got a couple of different categories. If it's under four thousand square feet, because mixed fuel mixed fuel is anything. If you want to put a wood burning fireplace in, that makes you a mixed fuel home. All right. Um and I'm not saying good or bad, I'm just stating what it is. So if you go mixed fuel and you've got to do, so you have to put in a solar PV system, not just solar ready, and you have to pre-wire for future electrification. That means if somebody goes to replace the furnace or the gas, or the, uh, yeah, the gas stove or dryer, later the, the facilities are there to use electric. So that's under 4,000 square feet. And again, the HERS is 42. 4,000 square feet and over, um, you have to do solar PV to get you to enough solar to get you to net zero. All right, that's if you're building the, the, the bigger homes, right? Um, why? You want to discourage that. I mean, honestly, that's what it is. You want to discourage. If you're going to do that, then we will, because they make the worst impact on things. And then um, any any of them, you have the option to make it a passive house, and uh, you still also have to do the wire. All of them, you have to do the wiring for future electrification. So, homes additions and alterations, same as the same as the stretch code. You deal with that same as the stretch code. Um, historic or existing homes, historic can be exempt from from the stretch code and from the opt-in code if they have, if it's registered. It's either local, national, state, or national. Um, they just have to have uh, a, has to be registered and has to ask for it, right? So I mean that's kind of the kind of the differences. Um, especially like the, so, 
sizing of the PV here in a residential size for mixed fuel buildings. Solar is required when there's a suitable, suitable roof area of 300 square feet or greater. So let's face it, there's a, they're putting, they're, they're encouraging you to, to make an all electric and we, we don't want to do the, the mixed fuel because it's, it doesn't really fall in line with the state's goals and, and laws, right? So um, all electric buildings, you don't have to have it required, just solar ready roofs. You're not required to put the solar in. The only time you're required to put solar in is if you're building a mixed fuel home, <coughs> right? So there's just, it kind of shows you, and if it's less than, <coughs> if it's uh, less than 4,000 square feet, the solar system has to produce 4KW. If you're building a, a 4,000 square foot or greater, then you have to have enough to bring you down to net zero, which is typically larger than 8KW. So any other uses, the size has to be 0.75 watts per square foot, which is the same as the commercial. Okay. Um, on multifamily, it gets a little bit tricky too, right? As far as understanding, because we have so many options. So on the new multifamilies, four stories and greater, and over twelve thousand square feet. If you're all electric, you can get the stretch code. Will let you be hers forty-five, or Teddy is the new. Uh, it is a new commercial type of thing that we're um, that is and actually it's only in Massachusetts right now it's it's really called targeted performance is the actual name for that compliance path which um, takes into account really the not the demand but the actual load and usage it's a more efficient way of looking at a um, high performance house and if, without getting too technical, there's a, a high performance type of uh, path, ASHRAE, ASHRAE 90.1 is another compliance path, which is more of an engineering type of thing. Or it can be passive house, which passive house is really, you know, your HERS on steroid. HERS is only one part of it. They, there's a lot of pieces to it. They're very healthy. They're very efficient. They're very resilient. If you're the resiliency, that's the other thing that's missing in all this, is a passive house. House in our climate, we lose power. That house can stay without freezing for several days, and that's one of the other things that's not being pushed as much right now. It's the, these these performance homes, I consider you know the homes we're building today are not our old our our parents' old Chevys. And stuff like that they're more of a you know they're more of a uh, modern type of vehicle with all the computers that you can't work on yourself they don't say that hard. Um, again if we're mixed fuel we're still we're at hers 42 Teddy or passive house the specialized code uh, is has to be if it's all electric it has to be passive house certified and um, if you're mixed fuel, it has to be passive house certified plus the wiring for electrification. That's for these multifamilies that are greater than four stories and over 12,000 square feet. Right, not the single family homes. So on the commercial end, the uh, if you're mixed fuel, you have to not only provide the wiring for the future but they actually have to show the design that the engineer will have to design it show that it's designed to meet that with the residential it's it's a little bit less stringent than that um, the passive house is an approved pathway in the new code that's as I said passive house and you can look them up if you're not familiar with it but there's passive house U.S. It's the Passive House Institute U.S. P.H.I. U.S. or Passive House Institute, which is based in Europe, and they they've been around for a while. It, it's 
it really takes it, it reduces um, thermal bridging. It makes it really is making our our envelope tight, consistent. Again, airtight. It's everything we we're doing to get down to 42. Only they go lower, mm -hmm. right? So that is one way to do it with the stretch code. It's an optional pathway for both residential and commercial and commercial buildings to meet the energy code. And it's an alternative to the HERS and the Teddy pathways. The specialized opt-in code uh, allows passive house certification. It's a requirement for the multifamily. That's going to be on the multifamily over 12,000 square feet. That's coming up um, at right now. It's coming up now. So the passive house is the is the path for that. What is it? It's a third, and that's the nice part about this for not only for the end user, for the code officials as well. Passive house and the hers. It's a third party, an independent third party. We're doing some of the work for you. We're doing work to protect you folks, the end users. What we do is we predict things based on the design. Then we go out and we do the inspections. And we also, we also do the inspections to make sure that what we predicted is what's built. And then we do the final model. And so we can, we can pretty much tell you how much you're gonna pay to heat and cool your house and be pretty accurate with it. So I bet Chris's next paycheck got it. <laughs> so, um, so you know, so that's what it is. They have standards, they, and th these are all called above code programs. And the other beautiful thing about Passive House, there's another program called um, from the DOE called Zero Energy Ready Homes. That's that's another program, and then of course there's Energy Star, which used to be the, the benchmark <coughs> for everything. Mm -hmm. But our codes here supersede Energy Star's requirements. However, you, you need an, a HERS rating to get an Energy Star rating. If, you, if I'm a builder and I'm building a house that has an Energy Star rating, I am eligible for a $2,500 tax credit from the federal government for the next 10 years for every home I build if I'm doing multifamily, it's $500. If I make that a zero energy ready home, that's $5,000 per house. And um, and passive house, I think, is close to that. They, there's some new numbers on that, and I'm not 100% sure what they are, but it's somewhere between Energy Star and and additionally, mass saves, which I think you'll cut out, you'll talk about at the end, right? The mass saves. Massive, the, the incentives, incentives and stuff. Yeah. So, yeah. so there's things to help offset some of the perceived costs as well, right? Heating loads can be reduced by 90 percent or more. I mean, it it really they're, they're really amazing, and you won't they don't look any different. So don't get concerned about that. This is the distillery in South Boston. A building it doesn't look any different than any other new building being built architecturally anyway. I can't say that I agree with all the new architectural styles, <laughs> but it doesn't look any different. That's a passive house commercial building. It's going to, you know, it, it, the cost the cost of running it is, is little. very little. So if it costs you a little bit more, and I don't want to put percentages and dollars on any of it, but Maybe there's a little bit of an initial investment, but the operating cost lowers that. There's a reason why there are uh, green, what they call green mortgages or energy efficiency mortgages, where the the bank will allow people to borrow more, or they actually people who may not have been able to get a conventional mortgage can get an energy mortgage because it's cheaper to operate and cheaper to own. So, um, Passive house can be any size, any shape. Look like there's here's one, right? That's a passive house. Just looks like an old Victorian. But it's real. I mean, it, these are real. We didn't just pull these out of Google. Um, at least I didn't. <laughs> right? 
but they can be any size. They can be residential homes, townhouses, multifamilies, commercial buildings, uh, schools or municipal buildings. That's the beauty of, of what they do. And that's why it's becoming universal across. It's probably the biggest sector of uh, high performance buildings, above code buildings. It does not, at this point, Passive House does not require you to be all electric or net zero, but it makes it easier to get there because it reduces the loads. Right. This is a great graphic because it's showing you uh, thermal images of buildings that were or weren't. You know, here's one that's not, it's leaking, it's cold. I'm sorry, these are the ones leaking heat. That's the one that's not, so it kind of relates to these. So, um, so as I said, it's scaling fast for multifamily buildings. It's becoming, it's huge. I also do a lot of work in Vermont and almost every project is, is doing this there now. And uh, multifamily anyway. So the, per, but, you know, it continues. Look at in two, 2021, there was, you know, 98. Now that we're over four, almost 14,000. Uh, is what they project we're already it's just going to grow I think it's going to grow steeper than that even because you know as a, from from here to maybe there I think it's going to go more like this so, but um, and over one third of them that, and that's the other thing is a lot of these are built uh, for low income families for affordable housing as well because because people can live in them. And even though the developers are spending the extra money on it, they can rent them. So and they're gonna get it back hard. that way. We might need to move faster, yeah. Yeah, what time is it? Okay. Yeah, we really. All right, well, I think I'm, I don't know where. <clears throat> oh, there's 54 slides, I guess. Well, I'm I hope sorry. You're, you're not showing all the slides. There's a bunch of kind of hidden. Oh, okay. Older Good. slides now. Okay, but will still. you tell me when you're ready to take over? So affordable housing and passive house, they're a great mix. Lower utility costs, higher level of indoor air quality, which is huge, huge, especially uh, typically the lower income um, settings, air quality is even more important, right? Because it's not as cognizant of, of everything and, or have the advantages to deal with it more. Um, and they're more comfortable. You should be comfortable in your home. It's your king. It's your castle, right? It's more comfortable. They're they're healthier, and they're easier to um, operate, and they last longer because that's the other thing that's lost in all of these codes is when we're making these buildings tighter, and we're making them better, the uh, the cost of warranties for the builders go down. The, the, the maintenance goes down, the durability increases. So the specialized code on the commercial end, um, it's really, you know, kind of like on the residential end, we've got schools, offices, municipal buildings. They're dealing with what we call um, the Teddy, like I said, or passive house for all electric. Under the stretch code, that's the way it is. <coughs> the stretch code makes most of the, commercial, the new commercial buildings are, are basically electric, all electric heat anyway, right? Uh, under what they call the relative performance compliance path, they are, and if the Teddy is, there's ways to trigger it, but most of it's there anyway. Uh, mixed fuel, as I said before, you're gonna have to do this Teddy calculation and solar PV, or you do the passive house and you, no matter what you do, you have to do the wiring if you go to mixed fuel. And uh, other commercial buildings over 20,000 square feet, they can use either this ASHRAE path or the Teddy path, which is not a whole lot different, just uh, a different measuring stick or the passive house. The specialized code for mixed fuel, you can again use ASHRAE plus solar, Teddy plus solar, or passive house and all of them need to do you, you have to do solar and you have to do the pre-wiring for electrification 
solar PV in the specialized zone. Um, it's required when you're using fossil fuels, it's required to get to the z net zero path. It's <laughs> optional for the all electric buildings. And there are exceptions if you've got a, a, a site that can't, just can't generate the, the solar. Um, it has to be certified, it has to be, you know, a design professional has to attest to that. It, you can't just say, oh, I tried and, and, and you can't do it. Right. For sizing of the PV in, in the specialized commercial code in 105.2, where it talks about on site renewable, it says new mixed fuel buildings shall have equipment. I think mean, there's probably too much detail. Okay. Need to know this stuff. Yeah. yeah. All right. Yeah. I won't. So, examples of solar, solar PV size here's a four story, 200,000 square foot high school. 160,000 square feet on the three largest floors. The minimum solar is going to be one and a half times the 160,000. It's going to be a 240 kW system on the on this four-story high school. Three-story 80,000 square foot building. It's going to be one and a half times 80 or 120 kW. That's what the uh, code is telling us that we we need to do if we're all electric, I mean, um, mixed fuel, right? Uh, increased incentives for builders. So this is the mass safe stuff you were talking about. Yeah, right. right. So mass, you guys have a great asset in mass safe, right? Um, granted, we all pay for it, but um, they, they will offer, so they're generally cheaper to build because, well, First of all, there's less. You don't have to run the piping, and there's a whole lot of there's a whole list. There's there's studies done that that fight both ways, right? So somewhere in the middle, is the truth. So mass save on um, one to four unit electric homes. If you get a hers up to uh, hers for 45, there is funding that will go towards the home yeah. of fifteen thousand dollars. If you can get it down to Hearst 35 or Passive House, they've got um, funding up to $20,000, $25,000. The uh, Mass Save for multifamily, they'll give up to $3,000 per unit, plus they'll help do the design study, right? And then uh, like I mentioned before, with the 45L tax credits, there's $2,500 or $5,000 that are tax credits. Now. These are not um, one-year programs. This is a 10-year program. So if I'm a builder, I can build this into my cost. Now, I don't want to it. It's not all profit, right? Because you're going to pay. And the thing is here, you're going to pay a HERS rater anyway in Massachusetts. It's hard to build anything without uh, residential without a HERS rater. So, you're already spending the cost. You're going to get between $2,500 and $5,000 as a tax credit. You don't have to use it all in one year. And this program goes on for 10 years. You can keep banking it. And that's for every home that you build. Um, so that's been a pretty, pretty good program. And it, it's really just starting to take off. Um, so that's those. Um, What's not included? I, I, I like this slide because we say this is what you got to do. This is what you got to do, and we're here to get rid of some of the some of the misconceptions, right? There is no ban on fossil fuels, right? You, there's no ban yet. You're saying you can do the mixed fuel, right? Um, there's no embodied carbon accounting. But solar PV, if you use fossil fuels, you're going to use solar PV, okay? And there is pre-wiring for future electric if using. So you would say, okay, those are add-on costs, right? Well, it's an add-on cost, but that's a benefit, right? Because it's going to reduce what they spend. It is an add-on cost. Maybe it's harder to sell or maybe it's harder to buy. It, it really shouldn't be as this is getting more involved um, everywhere and so on. 
requirements. So this is the summary. Efficiency requirements are the same as in the stretch code. We don't ask for any more uh, efficiencies, especially with the equipment, with the envelope, and, and so on. They still have to be EV ready. You've got to do that anyway. Multifamily buildings over three stories are only allowed to be passive house. So there, um, new mixed fuel buildings have to be pre-wired for electrification, have to have solar PV on available space. All right, homes over 4,000 square feet have to get to a HERS zero, which means the 42 plus the solar PV to bring it down. And it does bring it down fast. It, it, it does bring the HERS rating down fast. And all new electric buildings are really no different than the stretch code. So that's about it. That's about it. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's a duplicate slide. Yeah. So thank you. Frequently asked questions. Yeah, there's some, so there's some frequently asked questions and, and then we'll take some. But So does the opt-in specialized code apply to existing structures? No. It doesn't, right? Improvement to existing structures, depending on the size, are regulated by the stretch code and the base code. They're not under the um, they're not under the opt-in code. We're not trying to bring those into it. Will the special will the opt-in specialized code discourage creation of affordable housing? No, because the incentives are going to continue to encourage affordable housing while the specialized code delivers benefits. So um, I, I, I won't go off track again, but I'll just say one thing is I, I've always had this from, I, and I've worked for builders. I, I've worked for builders much of my career as well. And I've always had this thing, we say, well, it's cheaper to operate, but the builder says, but I have to pay, I have to charge them more to get in, right? I have to charge more to get in. And so was it make, what difference does it make that it's cheaper to operate? They don't care. Well, the incentives help that. The incent incentives are helping bring it down, and now it's cheaper for them to operate as well. So that's, that's what we, is meant here. Is it impossible to install a gas cooktop? Sure is. If you want to do a gas cooktop, and I love my gas stove, um, you can do it but then you are a mixed fuel, and then you have to follow the rules for a mixed fuel, right? Why adopt a specialized, the opt-in specialized code? The number one reason is that it requires pre-wiring, avoiding costly retrofits down the road. So in a few years when you can't buy a gas appliance, you're not gonna, and you gotta replace something in your house, you're not gonna have to go and do all the electric over again to get to it, to, to do it, which is costly, right? And five, why does the opt-in specialized code permit, oh, why does it permit fossil fuels, right? Well, it preserves a choice, right? It's a time when pricing is, is, is crazy and they can vary, but we, we, it's allowed the choice, net zero definitions. And what net zero is, is that you eventually produce as much as you use. Um, so the, yeah, you don't skip that. that. We've talked about that before. Um, I'll leave that one up because that's the last slide, and yeah. that's are, it. Are, Sorry, can you go back to the Q and A, the FAQs. Yeah. There you go, and leave that up. Oh, okay. Okay, thanks. Okay, that's it. Sorry to uh, drone on and on. Okay, so does anybody have any questions? Yes, sir. You're saying that you're learning as you go when it comes to all these rules and what you want to do with these houses. Of course, it's going to be a ton more expensive on the builder, which then goes to the homeowner. Uh, when it comes to supplies, <coughs> have you put those mandates because I do heating and air conditioning and they've gotten rid of almost the 80% efficient furnaces. Now, That's what about sure. when it comes to the building supplies, like you're talking about the windows, improving the windows on the structures, because 
I think everybody knows that, okay, they like their fossil fuels, which I love. It's cheaper to run than running electric. But at least when you have your fossil fuels, you're at the control of how much you want to use, how much your electric bill is going to be because you're hardly using it, and the use of the fossil fuels. We're at the whim at the Eversource and National Grid, which you look at our electric bills, the usage is nothing, it's the distribution fees. So to helping out the consumers with what you want to do, forcing us to putting on solar, why don't you work or are you working with the power companies to say, hey, why don't you drop down these electric bills of what you're doing to the consumers because people aren't going to be building houses, they're going to be renting more, and then after they're going to have to put on the electric key, and you're saying they're going to be more efficient with these uh, opt-in houses, but they're not going to be able to afford the electric bills because they're so high to heating up their houses. Because I work on these heat pumps, they're not that efficient. You could say that, as soon as you said 30 degrees, you stopped your conversation saying, I don't want to get into it. Well, I work on these things, they're not that efficient. And all people do is they're complaining about their electric bills. People had a, a, in Northampton had an all heat pump. He was promised the thing was going to be efficient. He had his five to six hundred dollar a month electric bills, having a high efficient heat pump system. Once it gets down so low, your backup, a redundant electric heat comes in, and that's what they're calling their supplemental heat, and that's five to six hundred dollars. How can you say it's more efficient when we have no control of what our electric bills are? but it's great for the environment as to where is our power coming from? What's the, what is the base source of our power? Is it water? Is it, is it nuclear? Is it wind? What is it for this state that we're getting our power from <coughs> that you're making all these rules yeah. for us to live in this state? What is the source of your power? Yeah, what's our source? <laughs> I believe you use all three of those. Okay, so we use all three of those. So you're talking about um, wood. You're actually pushing that burning wood because people just only have all wood in their homes to heat that you're using that as they'd have to get solar because it is a carbon product that they'd have to get solar even though it's not coal it's not gas it's not propane or it's not oil but because it's something that you know it's a table it's part of this paper you're now going to be taxing the biomass. The, yeah. right but you're going to be doing that as to so like we were talking about in the last last month's conversation, that you're opping and pushing out burning wood. That's what you're pretty much doing. What? He what? said it. It's, well, it's on his thing, on, on his display of, of getting rid of and taxing the people as to making them having solar because burning wood is a carbon product. Yes, right. If you go to a, if you, if you have a wood burning Perfect. fireplace, in an in a opt-in home that becomes mixed fuel. So with all this, if you're pushing with all this stuff of being electric, are you or somebody negotiating with the power companies because the distribution fees are way more expensive than it is for the usage? People are gonna go broke paying for electric bills, but hey, they're gonna be 50 degree, you know, 60 degree houses, but hey, the environment's doing great. Yeah. Well. I so are you a negotiator? I got a couple, you say, I got a couple you of comments you're working on, on it. I'll keep those to my Because you're saying you're working on it. Help work, work, on. Help work yeah. to <laughs> working with the consumer. I will tell you that they are constantly, they have the energy providers have uh, three year, every three years they have to renew their energy plan with the state. And that's always in the negotiation. And they're always having their heat, their feet, Held to the flame, not wood flames, but um, and so it is something that's always being worked on. I'm what I I'm here. I'm being paid by the utility companies as part of their having to. I don't. That's what Mass Save is. Mass Save is is all the utility providers, right? And the money comes <coughs> from. <coughs> From their from them, they have to part of their energy plan is they have to put so much into this and into the incentives. All that money that I was talking about before comes from that. I guess got I, I do have a question now. You're talking about the heat pump, I know, but you're talking about the heat pump where you you're, the guy had a six hundred dollar 
Electric bill, yeah. Electric bill. Is it a brand new house? It was, uh, no. Exactly. No, no, it wasn't. That's no why wasn't. it's a $600 utility bill. But his bills were less burning with oil. Well, that may be. He's just saying if, if the but that's, house was but not that's why the house is. isn't built for it. We're having you build the house for what we're doing, and that's that's why existing buildings people are don't have that code. kind of money. You they think they do? The well, power companies do. I don't do. think they do. I'm one of those people. Wait, can I just stop this yes. for a minute? Try to remember. First of all, we're not saying we want this. We're just looking at it. All right. The other thing is, it's only new construction we're talking about. So the entire building would be built in such a way so that it's much more efficient, not just putting in heat pumps. It's so the heat pumps don't even have to work that hard. It, it's the whole building. Insulation factors. And anyway, I don't know if we should do this. Yeah, I'll, I also I mean, want to just point out, this gentleman here does not work for the state. These are right. laws in, in the state of Massachusetts that are already passed. Uh, right, but okay. I mean, I don't take it so. but he was the one who just said, they're learning as they go. Well, you should learn everything and then present what you know, not learning what you know, because it's nice to saying electric's the way to go, but people are not going to be able to afford it. I've got solar in my house, and I still have a $200 electric bill, and I run wait, wood. Wait, you're talking about... And I have a, a concrete, high-efficient house. Yes. It can't be any more efficient, okay. a concrete house. All right. Okay. So it's it's one of those All things where done. they're increasing the rates on the electric bill, which as homeowners, we have no control over. Okay. They can keep Agree on raising that. the rates. Agree with and that. that's, that's And everybody can say that. They look up their bills. Geez, I didn't even use it. I'm lowering my heat, my gas, yeah. my whatever. I believe it's the same for, for natural gas. Right. And it's just, it's that's the discouraging as me being in the HVAC field, pushing the heat pumps, which your electric bills will go up higher. Right. Sorry to say, it, they're gonna. And it's more money out of your pocket. Okay. So point taken. Go ahead, Tony. Sorry. Sorry. Uh, the uh, one thing you didn't talk about, which concerns me a little bit, is the actual costs, which I brought up during my in initial commentary. I started to, and you, you talked about some of the incentives, but the MIT study I was referring to it goes from single, a single uh, family from anywhere from twenty-three thousand to with the multifamily homes, anywhere from to one hundred and three thousand. And also, the second part of that is we are, as as you alluded to, we're in a affordable housing situation right now. And the MIT study does say in black and white that this would that adopting the stretch code would push ownership of newly built single family homes out of reach between for between one and a half and one percent of households in the Commonwealth. That's additional. So it doesn't line up. I mean if you say there are additional incentives, I, I don't care about incentives. I, I want to talk about costs. Right. So those costs, you know, if you're saying, well we're gonna get this back, we're gonna get this back, it's still our money. So if you're saying if you're saying you're gonna add between twenty three and hundred and three thousand to the construction of a home. I wouldn't say that. Well, that's what MIT says. I didn't go to MIT, so I wouldn't say okay. it anyway. But, but so, so th there's no possible way that that's that. that that's I don't happen. believe that it. That my personal opinion is I don't believe that those numbers are totally accurate. But. But uh, he already admitted that it's going to cost more to build them. The trade-off right. is there's so much less money to so, operate. That's so when, when Madam Chairman, if I just may, if if you can, if you're considering this. How can we justify that when people can't afford homes? We we should we might want to consider going back to the base code so people can. So <laughs> I'm, I'm absolutely serious. Well, because no, give, then give, let, let the so market more to operate. It. Let people have let let the market let the free market and the builders yeah. operate. It's so I want to want to I want to put in just um, <clears throat> a perspective that uh, in the United States we don't buy houses with cash. So when you buy a house, you buy it through a financing of some kind. Um, and you have to have a down payment. Uh, you know, the, the subsidies that $15,000 you can get is going to go a long ways towards helping you with your down payment. If you're building, a, a, you know, code, a code build house right now, Mass Save is going to give you that $15,000. Um, once you get to, you know, how, how much does it cost to live in the house? Is a combination of your mortgage and your energy bills. And if the two of those added together are less than they would have been otherwise, if you have an inefficient house, um, 
it's you know it's been shown the uh, living in a house that's a high efficiency house your energy bills are going to be so low that when you combine them with the mortgage bill yeah. your monthly bills are going to be less so it's these houses are more affordable that's why they're being used for low income these houses are um, are more they're more affordable to live in they might be a little bit more uh, uh, you know the down payment might be a little bit more upfront but there's subsidies to help out with that um, so the, the cost piece it, it, you know the it's, it's, it's working in the homeowner's uh, direction um, because of this. It's, you know, the high efficiency home is a better home to live in. Okay. Um, so hold on. I, I want to jump in. Tommy, yep. go yep. ahead. You're our building inspector in town. Yes. yes. What do you, what are some of your observations about this? Yeah, I have an outline. I kind of want to go for it. Some of this will be facts. Some of it will be my opinion, um, but it'll be coming from the consumer from other inspectors, the other inspectors that are already in the opt-in, as well as um, the builders. So I'm not gonna say that any of this isn't a great idea, a bad idea. Um, it's just the fact of jumping into the opt-in. This is all coming too fast. Yeah. I mean, Art can, you remember at least two, I think it was in three of your trainings alone mm -hmm. for energy for us to catch up with it. Never mind what you know the builders have to, yeah. to catch up. Oh, there's been a big change. Yeah, and just last year, I think three trainings I was with, uh, with Art. Um, and it's going to come. This is going to come. I just don't think we should jump into the opt-in and have it yet. Speaking with the, uh, you know, other inspectors. The hers went from 55 to 52, um, and going to go to 42 in July of this year. And I have contractors that can't make the 52. You know, they're just barely making it. So it's going to be a, a tough, a tough July of this year. Um, just some. I've heard that. Any new house that's doing the opt-in is going to go from 200 amp to 400 amp service alone. Never mind, you can still have all the other, um, you know, gas whatever yeah. you want at the time. But that's going to be a huge expense. Um, one, some facts with Hadley is we've always done the last three or four years 12 or more homes, and since just the new energy code started this January 1st, we've uh, only done two this year. But Tommy, you also have to admit the Connor, interest Connor rates have jumped up right. to seven, eight right. percent. Yeah. So there's more than one oh, yeah. factor well, for sure. Right. Okay. We've had only we've had two big commercial projects new that were we had to push, push because they weren't going to. One definitely wasn't going to go through because the commercial uh, stretch code took effect July of last year, and we had to get those permits in, or one was not going to go in. They were going to cancel the whole project because of the expense, mm -hmm. what they were told from their hers rater and, and all. Mm -hmm. um, Good. You know, your additions, 1,000 square feet, over 1,000 square feet, or a model over 1,000 or 50%, um, they're not happening anymore. Right now, you can you can do, the trick is you can do a permit, and then a week later, pull the permit for more, so you'd have to pull two. There is tricks, but they will catch it. That was one thing Art had, had come up with in one of the trainings. Um, and what else? And it's just the, it's the cost. I mean, it's not just for a new time home, a new home buyer, but um, an elderly that wants to downsize. It's just all this could be a great idea, but it's just requiring it. It's just coming too fast. And I just I hope that Abby would not do the opt-in yet. Thank not that any of it's bad. No, thank you. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Okay. Anybody else have a question? I got a question. Okay. Um, what do you think about radiant heat? As far as the codes or just... Well, no. Is it practical? It, it, it all depends. You've you got an HVAC guy right there. Ask him. Probably one of the better things you can do. Because yeah. radiant heat is from seven feet down yeah. where forced hot air is... Uh, hot air rises, cold air drops, so it's great during the air conditioning season, but during the heating season, hot air rises, and you're talking from four and a half feet up, that's where the heat is, where you have to push the heat down, but when you're in your living room on your couch, you're feeling a little cold because all the heat's up here. Right. So radiant heat is definitely the way to go from here to five and a half feet is the way to go well, for radiant heat. And correct me if I'm wrong, steam heat is over 212, forced hot water is 170 degrees, roughly, and radiant heat is what, 110? Yep. So it's because you're not forcing, you're not raising the temperature of the water so much, you're getting more bang for your buck. Correct. Okay. Now, 
and I'm sure our building inspector could agree to this, the tighter your house is, you have to put in a heat ventilation you have cover to do that system. Anyway. You got right, stretch and, code. right, and that's part of the stretch code where you're making this house so tight yeah. that you now have to exhaust yeah. the air in the house to bring in the air that you've already conditioned. That's not true. That's not a science. Of course, it's true. Of course, it's true. If you're bringing in outside air that's 20 degrees mm -hmm. and exchanging it with a 70 degree air, the mixture is going to be 45 degrees that you have to now preheat that 45 degree air to 70. How can you not say that's, it's not true? Only that's what an HRV does, 50 number 50 one. Relationships. This building brings it in 10% outside air and 90% inside air and mixes them. No, nah, that's, that's on a rooftop unit. I'm talking about just for residential. Residential has two fans that run at the same speed, exchanging the air from outside so, to the inside. So that's the discouragement of, of having this stretch code from away, is that you're, you're spending the money, they're making it so tight, you want to avoid having mold, so you got to have an air exchange to bringing outside air. Say it's okay, it's 10 degrees outside or zero degree say outside. Zero. So zero, your the money that you wasted on your great electric bill from your heat pumps that you now have to spend it out the window to preheat it. Okay, there you go. So yeah, that's you know, that's the discouragement ahead, of stuff like yeah. that. So if you guys want to respond, yeah, I just want no, just, just another view. So right now, if our house is a leaky house, it, it's bringing in that zero degrees outside air. Sure. It's coming in. And it's not getting any energy recovery. So you're not, you know, and if air is coming in, there's air is going out someplace. Agreed. So, um, uh, so there you're just, now there you're heating up the full amount that comes in. When you have a leaky house, where the air comes through, that's where you're going to have moisture coming through, and that's where you tend to get mold build up and stuff. So when you have a leaky house, you have uncontrolled air coming in, and it's going through moldy old insulation, you know, animal nests and stuff like that, is not the healthiest air. Um, when you tighten the house and you actually control the air going in and out, like you do water right now, you know, right now we control water coming, we bring them into pipes and stuff. Same thing with air. You get a much healthier house. You have, and it also gives you an opportunity to filter it. If you want to filter it now for, you know, some kind of viruses, you don't need to, but um, that's a, now a possibility. So, um, energy recovery ventilation and controlled ventilation in a house is a fantastic idea. It's, it's, a, it's a really great idea because it allows you to have cleaner air, filtered air, and you capture 70, 80% of the heat that was normally going out. You're going to capture that uh, heat and put it in the air coming in. So you're, you're heating a lot less air. I, I agree. A really good thing. No, you're absolutely right. Whatever, you know, in. looser houses, the, you know, the heat's going to be going outside, but I've been in a ton of older houses that are leaky. I've never seen any mold. So no, that, that to, so to be saying that, it's based on those tighter houses that are creating those yeah. not fresh air, air circulation right, that's but, creating that. But talks okay, you know what? No, this no. is going really long and yeah. Yeah. really it's what we were just cover. trying to mm -hmm. learn was what is the difference between our current stretch code and the opt-in and whether you know, trying to get the opt-in adopted in Hadley is a good idea. And that's what we're looking at, and that's why we're bringing in the experts to have this discussion, to learn more about it. Right. And it's Billy, I'm just wondering if you would share anything about the building you work in uh, and what you've seen as the results. Uh, sure, so yeah, I work at the Hitchcock Center, Billy Spitzer, I okay. work at the Hitchcock Center. And Amherst, I live in Hadley, um, and we have what's called a living building, which is a net zero building, um, uh, among other things. And um, it does have heat pumps. Um, it is. It does have heat recovery, ventilation. Um, it's a really wonderful building to operate. Um, you know, it did have a higher than, you know, did there was a premium cost in the construction. Um, but I think we're seeing the benefit on the operating side, both in terms of cost and comfort. Um, so it's not exactly the same as is there a passive solar house. On that What's that? Is there solar on that? Yep, yep. It's so it's you're solar. making your own electricity. We're making our own. It's it's net zero on an annual basis. We have to buy electricity in the winter, and we sell it to the grid, or we get right. solar energy credits uh, when we're producing ex excess. Um, it's not exactly the same as a passive house, but it's similar. It's not exactly the same as, you know, the current heat pumps, but it's similar. Um, and I think we're really interested in understanding, like, how the, 
living building standard, which is like a higher standard even than the LEED certification, how is it applicable to ordinary houses? And like no one's figured that out. There are only like 34 living buildings in the world, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, but I think the, the Hitchcock Center is a good demonstration that this kind of thing can work. It's been operating since 2016. Um, and, um, you know, it's uh, lower cost of operation than it would have been otherwise and also um, very pleasant, really good air quality as you guys were talking about. Um, and um, also uh, not a lot of capital costs to replace stuff as well. So yeah. I, I think one thing I heard that was really interesting was like the volatility of electric costs. And mm -hmm. that's something that like for us is mitigated by having solar. Um, yeah. Well, and I'm curious, thank you for sharing your comment. I'm curious, you know, you're seeing the, the codes change over time. Yes. They're tightening up. There's just no doubt. How soon do you think this will just happen naturally, even without these changes? Well, years ago, we were told that this was going to combine anyway, that the stretch code would kind of go away, and it just seems now it's hauling ahead. I mean, I've had to adopt this in Southampton, West Hampton. I was the one here in Hadley and Sunderland, and, and I'm getting the feedback, geez, you you know, back then we were told, and I think Art would, you know, that eventually it was all just going to merge, that it didn't matter whether it was the IECC or the mass right. stretch. And, and you'll they, eventually we're see that. We're catching up, we're, we're going further away every three years, is what I've seen. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's and I'm not saying yeah. any of it's a bad idea. I, I did an ERV in mine. I was lucky enough to be able to afford it seven years ago, and it's the best way to go, but. It's forcing people to do it, which we do now, and it's just the expense. That's all that yeah. I, I just don't think is, is right. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Appreciate it. Okay, so thank you very much. Yes, thank you yes. both very we much. We need to move on to uh, farm conversation. Sure. So it was a while ago that we talked about what are some more ways that we can spread the word. And uh, we talked about having some farm conversations. So interesting. Um, in talking with Denise Barstow Mans, um, they are actually doing a um, farm conversation for dairy farmers. It's entitled No More Normal, a Dairy Farmer Roundtable Discussion on Clim Climate yeah. Adaptation. So it's, let's face it, there's no more normal growing seasons anymore. First and last frosts are erratic. Precipitation is all over the place. Heavy rains, one summer droughts, the next join American Farmlands, um, New England Climate and Ag Team, and Steve and Barstow for a, far a Dairy Farmer Roundtable discussion of strategies and ideas for building resilience in our farmlands. Stephen will kick off the conversation with some of his observations and approach to dairy farming in increasingly variable weather and the role that the soil health plays in managing that that is going to be held on January 22nd from 11 to 1.30. Um, they are encouraging dairy farmers to apply, but I think anybody who is interested um, can. But this is farmer-focused peer-to-peer uh, event lunch will be provided. So just wanted to put that out to all the members of this committee and everybody else who happens to be listening at home. So that brings us to the second part of it. So that's for dairy farmers. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I love some cards. I appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you. Yep. All right. So um, Ellen Drews, who manages a start um, in Hadley, um, she offered some ideas, and my brother Wally offered to host. And what they're doing is they're bringing some different groups together. Uh, including CESA, AFT, some others, and they are hoping to have a panel discussion of how farmers are adapting to climate change and what struggles um, are. I could imagine that attendees who are not farmers might learn a bit about how climate change is impacting local agriculture and how they can support us with, through their voting and purchasing power. Hadley is such a great town because of the way agriculture is woven throughout. Um, I think uh, most people know a farmer personally, and many um, people grow and raise crops or animals, um, even if it's not for an enterprise. I'm not sure how you would gauge interest in attendance, but putting that out, hoping to have something happen tail into February before the growing season. 
okay. uh, because I know that the greenhouses will be going in to production starting in March. So, <coughs> so it would take place at w uh, Wally's place. So it's going to take place at Plainville Farm, which is at 135 Mount Warner Road in Hadley. That will be the home base. We don't have a date yet for it. We don't. We don't. Because? Because I have not heard back from Stephen or from Julie Fine. Okay. Any other questions, comments? What else from committee members first? Um, is that talk something that we would be co-hosting with Wally? So we would we would be co-hosting with with Wally and Plainville Farm. Okay. Yep. So we originally thought we would do it independently, and um, the people who are running the talk at Barstow said that they are happy to help make this happen. So it's American Farmland Trust who is partnering with Wally, who is happy to work with us and spread the word to farmers in the area. Is Not that where Julie is from? That uh, Julie is from American Farmland Trust. What's her last name? Julie Fi. Okay. <clears throat> Then would somebody <laughs> from CISA be there also? Yes. Okay. Steve in Toronto would be there so from CISA. That's part of the problem yep. that you're waiting to hear from. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep. If we ask our uh, state representative and senator? Uh, we did not. And that's something that I can put out to Joe Comerford and Dan Carey. I can do that. I mean, they may say no, but they may find it. I think they have shown a lot of interest in this. And I think knowing that this is going on is useful. I think that's a really good idea. Yeah, that's a great idea. Because that's, that's Don't good. forget Mindy and, and um, Mindy, Lindy Sabadosa. Lindy, Lindy, yeah, that's it. Yes. Lindsay. 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 Yeah. And that is the extent of the farm conversation. Okay. So, Jack, is that unfolds? If you need help, let me know. Okay, thank you. I appreciate yes. it. Yeah. And, Michael, I'll probably be turning to you and maybe Kathy as mm -hmm. well. Thank you. Okay. Great. Sure. Me too. What? <coughs> let me know when, let me know more information about that. That would be great if you could yeah. videotape it. Wonderful. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, so we're on the landfill. Um, basically, we're, the next there's two next steps. One is to uh, figure out the battery incentives, which I'm, and the battery and the disposal costs. And I got somebody working on it for free. It's a friend of a friend, so I can't push them along. But they battery or solar, because we were talking about disposal of the solar panels. Disposal costs for the whole thing. Because you were okay. Because you were saying batteries too, or just me. Solar battery. and battery. Okay, I understand. Yeah, 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 yep. Yeah. And um, and and then there's also a battery incentive that wasn't included in the financials that for I for provided. having storage on there. Yeah, you required about. over uh, over five hundred over uh, over five hundred kW. You required to have battery storage on site, and so. In, 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 and so what we're trying to do is figure out what the, ins and it's a very complicated state formula that determines how much per watt you get for having those batteries there. So somebody's putting those numbers together for us, um, and, and then you had raised a question about what the disposal costs were, and so that individual also is capable of putting those numbers together as well. Has anybody thought about <clears throat> with those batteries, because batteries do go bad, what it would do to our ground and our water? Because most have had these on an aquifer as to what could happen to having these batteries on site. So the state... They would probably leak into the landfill. No, they, no. <laughs> the, the fire chief is very explicit about having them on concrete pads with edges so that they cannot leak. Okay. Right? Got it. You can talk more about batteries. Yes, we battery actually, have, I did a training, and Mike has done the same one as well. And um, actually, DEP, with the battery storage, unfortunately, they haven't really gotten their hands in it enough. So planning, we're all working to do some type of, whether it be a, a dike around or something, you know, we're going to work on because the state is going to tell the planning board they're going to have to allow them. So yeah. what it looks like is going to happen. And, and this is going to take years mm -hmm. to implement. So by by the time... You know, it actually happened. Some of this stuff's going to be. The things are going on that board where we had that thing, it's not going to take long by the looks of it. No. Like you're saying, the state's going to make us do it, mm -hmm. whether it we like it or not. Yeah. So, whether three, five years, but at least 
having the right questions to ask, you know, leakage, drainage, yep. aquifer. Yep. Hey, yep. Our, our, our land is known for its cucumbers, its corn, and its asparagus, knowing yep. that if something's contaminated because of something that people out of Boston, let's put it next to, uh, let's put it next to their water supply in Belchertown, yeah. see what they like. <laughs> And tobacco too. And tobacco, of right. course. No, we don't of course. Want any contamination, that's for yeah. sure. Anyway, Jane, you want to talk about what a next step might be to present? So the town is working with a consultant to look at a bigger picture for solar for the whole town and what that would involve. And that, again, is not something that happens quickly because there's so many different parameters to it. But okay. Yeah. And, and the landfill is the site being looked at at this point. Th that is what the con okay and how long when it was that consultant hired wasn't hired it's a, like your friend somebody who's giving some basic information so we then know where to go okay great because it will have to go out to bid that will cost money so before that piece happens the town is looking for as much freebie as we can get okay. so is that meeting going to happen that Carolyn got in touch with us about she's working on it okay is that the same consultant the yeah the the guy so that John, we met well, with? and there might John. be some others. Okay, Jonathan Perroth, and then yeah, and there may be Sunbug some others. Sunbug uh, is a yeah. solar company yeah. that yeah, yeah. But we were. She asked our opinion. My opinion was everybody on the committee should be included in the meeting, not just the chairs, and because I want you there because you you're kind of our solar. So as we hear more about what the town has planned we will let everybody on the committee know. And is it your understanding, Tommy, that the state is saying that, what is it, a 50% reduction by 2030? Is that what yes. they were saying? Yeah. So that is the state mandate, a pretty high bar. Yes. Okay. Have they put a penalty out for that? I don't know. Good question. After 2031, you'll know. <laughs> I won't be there. Sorry about that. <laughs> so, um, this is backing up a little. So, are we done talking about solar? So, you feel like do, for that line drawing, that first step? Well, my, yeah, I mean, I, it sounds like we've got two different parallel efforts yeah. going on here. So, maybe and we they should have this I think they should be first. merged, probably. Yeah, I, I'm encouraging that. So, okay. And then from there, we can figure out what our next step is. Um, Okay, so I'm going to back up a little bit here too about the opt-in specialized code. So we got some information tonight. It was not the presentation that I was expecting at all. But anyway, he, he did give us some information. You know, it's up to us to decide, do we, is this something we want to present to the select board and try to get adopted or not? And I feel like we just, do people want some time to think about it or? Could you vote now whether mm -hmm. you think we should I, go I forward? I think we need to learn more, mm -hmm. in my opinion. It, this was very complicated, what, what they were putting forth. I think it's also very interesting with what you say, how the state is constantly adjusting some of the codes well, they're and not guidelines. constantly. It's about every six every months. Years. Every three years. Oh, every yeah. three years you yeah. get an update. Yeah. So that that's what I've actually been thinking, is that whether we adopt the, the specialized code or not, it, the stretch code is going to, over the next couple few years, update to that anyway. Yes. So, like, so why bother? That, that's my opinion. I mean, I, and, and I'm talking, we're the ones that have to enforce it. Well, especially because we just they, became a green right. community. We're just getting going with the stretch code. Like, it's just too much. I don't that's think right. about it would be wasting energy. I it think would waste so. in, um, and I think we're it's going we're gonna evolve into that anyway. So that's my opinion. I, I don't think we should do any more about this. Well other members of the committee, based on some of the things you heard tonight and some of the things you knew before, where do you all stand? It just seems like it would take a lot of effort to try to move the ball just a little tiny bit for, for forward I on agree. this. Mm -hmm. yeah. And, yeah. and it seems like uh, it's not worth it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I agree well, and that. especially because there's, uh, you know, the added incentive to go electric, but I think 
I mean, Chris and I had some conversations on the side, and he said, you know, like I've been thinking about the new DPW. And, and he, what he said, I mean, I'm not a builder, and, you know, back me up if this is not right or is. He said, you know, anybody who's looking to save money and have the building be really efficient is going to go all electric anyway. You don't really need more code to make them do it. It's, you know, right. that, that that's just the best way to go. So, Well, I've heard off the record any funded uh, municipal state, any state funded municipal building is going to have to be all electric. So anything huh. like that, it's going to... Well, I don't know if there's that rule, but one thing I was reading about Mass Save is that as of, I think, August 31st, 2024, that's the last date that Mass Save will give any incentives for gas or any fossil fuel using appliance or heating system. You just be, if you want that, you're on your own, you've got to pay for it all yourself. So there are incentives for going electric, but in my opinion, I, I don't think we should move forward. But I think, you know, we should vote on it. What do you well, I don't think we have to do yeah, a vote I think, vote on yeah. I think yeah. we can explore more, hear more. We learned a few things today. I don't know if this is where the town will end up, but we can keep exploring. I think it was worth having people come in that knew more about it than us. Right. This I think was it was worth hearing other people's opinion. Well, Thank you for really coming nice, tonight. Two of the best there, Art. Like I said, I think yeah. it was last year with Art. And he's, uh, he actually has helped us a lot. He said, Art "Do fast with the inspectors and maps because we were pushing it so fast." So. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. So it was very wasn't what I was expecting, but anyway. Um, Are okay. there any topics or items not anticipated? Is there anything not anticipated? All right. Who wants to be note taker next time? <laughs> We're <laughs> that was a good good plan. Potato. We're rotating through, so we, I need a volunteer for notes next time. Other than Marion. Well, let's just see who says the radio. I, I can do it again. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for doing it. Yep. Thank you. Sure. So next meeting, um, what we're doing is we're alternating as chair. So Kathy took this meeting. Next meeting, I'll take more of a leadership role. Um, there's a few topics to consider. Um, and we'll see who's available to share. And um, in the meantime, just keep your ears open about the opt-in stretch code. If you learn anything more about it, bring it to this this group. Can I put something on the agenda as a possibility? Sure. If you're planning to have your cleanup in the spring, oh. you should start talking yeah, yeah, about yeah. it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's actually pretty complicated to plan, but it's worked well. Um, this would be the fourth year, I think, that we're doing it. Um, and we would be looking at someday around Earth Day, like Earth Day is April 23rd. That's usually when it's warm. We try doing it early to avoid the ticks because a few people get bit big time. Um, but also, last year we got snowed out. <laughs> right. We could have a snow date. <laughs> yeah. All right. So thanks. So are we done? Is that good? I have a motion to adjourn. Make a motion to adjourn. Second. 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 Second